one of the things that came out of that conversation was that there was a triggering of the little children inside of the adults who are trying to model something that they have no reference over or also thinking that they're that somehow this is a kind of a interrogation of them as parents and of people when really it can also be this notion of I was beat, you know, I was whooped, I was so it's it's complicated. Certainly want we want our we want our children's lives to be better than ours. I think that's a natural instinct. However, these old wirings come up, you know, so I think that's what was on the table as Dr. Patton was giving us a lot of data, but underneath that data was real life, you know, with real situations. And how do we start to undo that programming of violence as a way of protection or violence as love or violence in its intersectionality with love and sex? Like it was, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a lot. And, you know, I think about not only the child that is living um, in all of us, but the neglected child um, who was not nurtured, cared for, and parented. I think of um, sororities and fraternities, particularly those of color. Uh, I mean, not that white fraternities and sororities, but I'm talking about um, our fraternities and sororities and the violence that is attached and labeled as love and sisterhood and brotherhood that you endure the beatings, you endure the humiliation, you endure the shame all under the umbrella of uh, unity. And so much of this is rooted uh, certainly in how we were objectified, how black people were objectified in slavery, that you were useful, but only for what you could do for the other, that you were not fully human and that being harmed, beat, raped, um, that these behaviors and these crimes actually against the body, the black body and against the black brain and the black soul uh, were not seen as um, injurious because Black people were not seen as fully human. And so there is something about uh, parents, Black parents, who are at their own wit's end, who have not seen what it looks like to be corrected and not punished. See, there's a huge difference between correction and punishment. There's a huge difference between correction and uh, discipline uh, and harm and humiliation. And so I look, you know, I am an ordained minister as well. I'm a psychologist, but I'm also an ordained minister. And I hear scriptures like spare the rod and spoil the child being used to not only promote, but to endorse and actually take God's signature and misuse it as um, something that is behind physical and corporate punishment. So a lot of this has to do with, we don't have the example of what it means to correct and to restore the soul of a child when there has been disrespect. I hear, you know, I'm sometimes I'm whether I'm in the grocery store or wherever I am, and I hear parents, uh, and this is I don't have to go outside of my family to tell this story. So, you know, we all know people, if it is not us, it is our, you know, it's the people who we live with or our sisters or brothers or nieces or nephews. And the volume. I'm not even talking about physically harming a child. I'm talking about the way that Black parents often curse, call children out of their names, and then dare that child to not replicate that same disrespect to them. And so there is something terribly broken in our families about pain, 
you know, I've said, and Karen, you know, I've said this before here on your show, that a lot of the gun violence, what is happening here in Philadelphia, what's happening in Chicago, what's happening in their, these major cities, black on black crime, so much of that has to do with little children whose feelings are hurt about being called out of their name or somebody cheated on them or, and they go to hurt someone because they don't have the skills to manage uh, being humiliated, being embarrassed. And so guns are replaced instead of tears. If some of these black and brown boys and girls, young men and women could weep and talk about their fears, guns would not be needed. But if I need to pretend that I'm okay when I'm not okay, violence in and of itself is a place to hide. It's a place to feel powerful as a parent, like I'm in control. So but this it's is beyond the just the parent. It's not, I mean, we're talking about a culture, a absolutely. society, a government. And I feel like we can't go and ask parents to do something when we have a whole society that's built about around you being compliant. Our military is about violence. As you said, absolutely. the fraternities, the sorority, trauma bonds, are powerful and strong and they work to make people be compliant. So you, we have a society built around that. How are we, we going to get, and what we're we all do, privileged but, here. Yeah, yeah privileged but, I, here. but I will say this, if we expect a society that benefits from our self-destruction to help us correct and heal ourselves, we're in trouble. Oof, so it is, right, not, uh, it is not to blame parents, but it is to say that, and you're right, we are all privileged that are here, that if somehow we do not learn how to care for the desperation in ourselves, and we think that a society that has exploited and benefits from exploiting us is going to turn around and help us love ourselves and love our children, that is not going to happen. Agreed. Let's let's, uh, let's um, Dr. Robin uh, and thank you for that, Tanya. Um, Michaela a Angela Davis is here as well. Eight six six eight zero one eight two five five is Wellness Wednesday on the Karen Hunter Show. We start off the show talking about Cosby. We got a whole gaggle of black men call up, um, and I hate black on black crime just because I think it perpetuates a narrative that uh, is not healthy for us. Uh, but you know, I know you were saying it for a particular reason uh, to to demonstrate actual black on black violence. Um, it was disappointing to, to hear the amount of defense that people were, uh, you know, coming to Bill Cosby, uh, even Felicia Rashad, who I, I understand, you know, loves him and worked with him. However, two things can be true. You can be a lovely person to me and be a rapist uh, to that person and, and navigating the complexities and the, and the hypocrisies that we live with every day that we accept every day is part of the problem that we accept a lot of things that are wrong. So this is an easy thing to accept. Bill Cosby was wrong by the criminal justice system. The prosecutor lied and then, then he got bamboozled, but he did rape this woman and he admitted that he did it. So he's a rapist. So let's be re very clear about that. Two things would be true. Great uh, entertainer, probably great for society and the images that he projected of black people, Alvin Poussaint and all of that stuff. Yes. And all of the stuff he did with Sidney Poitier. Great. I spy. Yes. All of that. How do we deal with those among us? And we see it with R. Kelly, now with Bill Cosby. We saw it with OJ before, and there's still people who still think OJ was set up, whatever. How do we navigate that to be healthy? Because I don't know how we move forward if we have such a large group, particularly, they're, they're Black women too, they're women too, who will defend the indefensible and have like this moral uh, out clause for, for themselves and for us. And well, white people do it, so why can't we? Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, and you everything you said has so much uh, value and volume that so much of this both and and you're so right. We want things to be either or. And the truth of the matter is our lives are full of both. And as you just said, Cosby not could have been he did a lot of things that were valuable for society, valuable for black society. And he harmed, raped 
this woman and supposedly others. And so I think a part of leaning into this with more honesty and integrity is being able to look in our own lives and see where there may be someone that we love and care for personally who has harmed other people that we know. So they did not harm us directly, but they've harmed other people. And so you ask, how do we move forward? How do we move forward actually has a whole lot to do with whether or not we've made a commitment to what is true. See, there is no debate about what Bill Cosby did, meaning that, I mean, he himself, when I say, and what I mean is people are debating it. He himself talked about what he did, but that it was consensual. And one would have to ask, when you give someone pills, when you give someone quaaludes, when you uh, lure someone because of your power and your fame, is there a responsibility? I've heard women say this, what is the responsibility of the woman? This is like asking when a woman drinks too much or a girl drinks too much and she's raped, did she have responsibility for getting drunk? Well, she had responsibility for drinking too much, but not responsibility for being raped. And so I think we have to get very clear that violence, which rape is violence, and making someone um, vulnerable to you using drugs and alcohol, and then exploiting them, whether or not the plan was to have sex, whether or not they said they wanted to have sex, the moment they are no longer able to choose is the moment that is a crime. And so I think this is bigger to me than Bill Cosby. It has so much to do with, in our community, how we don't want to see what is true. We don't want to see it about pastors. We don't want to see it about mom, mom or pop, pop. We don't want to, you know, so there is a fragility. And let us go back to where does that come from? You know, Tanya, you were talking about systemic um, oppression, systemic injuring. There is so much pretending that we are okay because we carry so much shame about not being okay because we've been oppressed. And so there is a systemic piece of this, no question about it, why Bill Cosby and OJ, as you said, there are people who are still debating or talking about or sure that OJ was set up because they don't want to believe that a black man would sell his soul and harm, murder, rape someone else. And so this has a lot to do with whether or not we're willing to be on a journey and be held accountable for what is true. Agreed. I also want to say that like Dr. Patton was talking about, you know, brain development and what we're able to understand, you know, at different ages of our life. This is it's so hard for me, but you know, men being kind and gentle to women, I think they're, for myself, with the first molester I'm aware of, I don't think I was able to even call it what it was. And I literally had a therapist who said it wasn't because I had financial benefits from it. Mm -hmm. I remember telling teachers and telling people, and, 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 and so when you're young, you're not clear, you're looking to adults, all of that, that feeds in. And the solution is going to be so big. And, and, but then on my spiritual self, I go, everything's evolving towards greater and greater good. That's what I want to believe. I used to intervene when parents were beating their children in public. And then I had to step back and say, you know, they have a, a, a God and it's not me. And I don't know what, you know, is in the plan for them, but most of us are fortunate enough to survive their parents and whatever that is, it's not my place. What do you think of that? Well, you know, I think two things. One, just thank you for sharing that piece of your own story and journey, because that um, is so important. There are so many girls 
who have been blamed and then they become women who become uncertain about whether or not what happened to them was right or wrong, whether or not they deserved it. So because there was financial gain, I mean, and a therapist saying, because that was financial gain, that there was financial gain for you, what does that have to do with the violation that happened to your body? And so until, and that's why I said this journey with truth, that until someone is willing to say, it doesn't matter what financial gain you may or may not have had, what a high price to pay um, to benefit supposedly financially from being harmed um, in a way that would, that would shape the rest of your life. And so I think we as women and therapists and clergy need to be very clear that abuse is abuse is abuse and that it is never warranted. I have said to women who said, well, maybe my clothes were seductive. Maybe my skirt was short. Maybe, may and I said, I don't care if you took your clothes off, stood in front of your father, stepfather, whomever, said, I want to have sex. It is the responsibility of the adult to say, get your clothes on. Absolutely not. And so there is something that we need to own that we are still blaming women and girls, girls and women for their victimization. So that's number one. Two, when you're talking about brain development, there's no question that the brain is not fully developed until we're 20, at least 25. So there are so many choices that aren't really choices that we think we are choosing um, to be sexual. We think we are choosing uh, to be in a relationship. We think we are choosing to be on the pole. You know, we think we're choosing this, but I'm 15, you know, I'm 18. An 18 year old may be able to vote for the president of the United States, but they often cannot vote for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it is a completely Whew. different thing just because you, and 21, you can drink. But often at 21, you cannot drink the living water that would purify and cleanse you, uphold you. And so I feel that brain um, development and what kids are being uh, blamed for, what women are being blamed for is unfair. And to your last point about all things in some ways are in divine order. That's not the exact thing you said, but you're talking about, I think, I believe that too. That doesn't mean that I believe that everything that is happening is the will of the universe, is the will of God. What I do believe is that we each have a will. And so there is a, a point at which, because I see a lot of things as well, and I don't speak about most of what I see or I would be talking all the time. What I do do is I ask, what is this in my life in this moment? Why am I bearing witness to this? What am I to take from this? What am I to know? And if the few times I intervene, I might go to a parent and say to them, I don't know about you, but this has been a hard day. I don't know about you, but I think if one more person is gonna ask me for anything, I feel like I could blow my own top. And the per often the person will look at me like, first, what, what is this? Who are you? And then immediately they're de-escalating. Does that mean they're gonna never hit their child again? They're never gonna, no, of course it doesn't mean that, but it means that maybe for that five seconds or 10 seconds, they understood that I saw them, not as an abusive, horrible parent, but as someone like me, who was worn out and tired, who needed somebody to see them and give them even a break from ranting and raving and being out of control. And so I think we need to know our lanes and stay in our place, which I do. And when we intervene, it should never be with judgment. It should never be with shame. It should never be with, you're going to ruin your child if you do this, it just may be that it's been a hard day. And I see it looks like your day is like mine. 